let's move on. Uh, I usually don't cover papers that have a review nature to them, but this one is interesting because it's actually trying to define what we mean when we say understanding a deep neural network, what we mean when we say interpretable or interpretability or explainability or explainable AI. What do we actually mean by that? What's the definition? When it comes to neural networks, when you use the word understanding, you mean a functional understanding of your model, what your model is actually doing in practice. What are its predictions? Where is it looking when it's making a prediction? What are some prototypical examples of a particular concept? And this is in contrast to knowing the lower level mechanisms of your neural network. How is it operating or what are the algorithmic understanding of deep neural networks? So we don't care about lower level mechanistics or algorithmic understanding. We care about what our neural network is actually doing in practice. Where is it looking? Why is it making that prediction? But if you're interested in lower level mechanistics or algorithmic understanding, that's what we have been doing so far in the course. When we were going through every single architecture, trying to design them and try to understand, should we put a convolution here? If we want to reduce the number of computations, should we use one by one convolutions? Uh, should we use depth-wise separable convolutions? So those sorts of analysis we have been doing so far. Now we are interested in the functional understanding. And this is actually more useful. What do we mean by interpretation? There is usually some abstract concept like a predicted class or some abstract notions that your neural network is encoding in its feature mass or, it, or in its activities, in its hidden layers. There is some abstract concept. There is no way for us to understand it for a human being unless you map them back into a domain that a human can understand. And what are the domains that a human can understand? A human can understand images. They can look at it and say, okay, my neural network is looking at this part of my image. They can understand text. For instance, these words in my sentence are the most important ones for a particular prediction, for a particular concept. Or they can listen to a music or they can listen to a speech and interpret it. So a human can understand images, text, speech. So we need to have a mapping from the abstract concepts back to the images where we can understand. That's interpretation. Explanation, you usually... Your input is going to be a collection of features of interpretable domain, for instance, a bunch of pixels in your image, and the image is your interpretable domain, or a bunch of words in your text. These are the features. Whenever you say, I want to explain my model, you're asking what words in this sentence contributed for a particular decision that my neural network made or what pixels are the most important ones when it comes to predicting a particular class. And you can think of this as what we have been doing so far. We were creating a heat map of where our neural network was looking at in our image or what words it's looking at and try to highlight them. So both of them are a mapping from your abstract concepts to your input image. But there are differences. I'm gonna go through the differences shortly. We saw this method. Activ activation maximization, it was two papers ago, and that's about the interpretation. You give it a concept, maybe it's the concept of a dog, and then you're asking your neural network, show me an image of a dog, of this particular concept. And what we did was we wrote down the log of that probability, and we started maximizing with respect to the input. What image corresponds to this particular concept. And that's going to give you a prototype of or prototypical representation of that particular class. Let's apply to a NIST. And that's going to give you, for instance, if your WC is a zero, that's going to give you a representation of the number zero. If your number is one, the concept is one, it's going to give you an image of a one. And these are interpretable. A human can look at it and say, OK, you are doing the right thing. We can actually improve upon that. These are a little bit blurry. We can make them sharper. How? 
by using an expert. But what is an expert? You are just writing a model of your data. You are learning the underlying distribution of your data. So let's say you learn the underlying distribution using some method. Now what you're doing is you are saying, not only I want you to show me a, a representative of that particular concept, but I want it to be part of my data or be very similar to my data. And the question is, what is this WC? This is the corresponding class. For instance, this could be a dog, a cat, a room, a tiger, uh, a fish. Okay. So show me an image of a fish, and then it's going to show you to you, show it to you. Now you can have an expert. You say, I know how my data is going to look like. I have a distribution over my data, and give me an example which is the closest to my data distribution, and that's going to make your numbers sharper. Maybe having this uh, L2 penalty was not the correct thing to do previously. Maybe this is better. But there is a catch. Learning the distribution of high dimensional objects like images, which could end up being multimodal and complex, is not easy. Maybe it is easy for some uh, data set like NMIST. But if you go to ImageNet, it's going to get harder and harder. Maybe you don't really care about the functional form of your probability. Maybe it is enough to be able to sample from it. And that is where ideas of generative models are going to come in. You're going to have a latent representation, Z, which is going to have a simple distribution, maybe normal with zero and identity. You can take that, push it through a nonlinear function, G, which you already trained on your data. So there is no training going on anymore here. You take Z, you push it through G, and that's going to give you images that are going to look like real images. That's the job of the generator. Now you do your maximization over the latent space, over this hidden space, or you can call it the code space. This is a code. You are decoding it using G. G is your decoder. And then once you find Z star, the best one, you can just take that, push it through your generator, which is a neural network, it's convolution, and then it's going to give you your image, X star. And these are going to end up being more realistic looking. The previous one was too sharp. The one before was uh, a little bit blurry, but this one seems to be more realistic, like the type of handwriting that we see in MIST. But what are these? These are all interpretation. You are interpreting a particular class, and they're global. All you are giving it is the corresponding concept, is the corresponding concept of a number zero, concept of a number one. And then it's going to give you interpretable images that you can show to a human and it's going to convince them that your neural network actually learned something about number zero, about this concept. That's interpretation. It's global. You can actually make that local. Not only you can give it the corresponding class, you can give it the corresponding input and ask this question, where are you looking to find this particular concept. So you're asking your neural network, where are you looking in the input image to give me this concept? And we saw examples of this, guided backpropagation or backpropagation or deconflet was doing that, exactly that for us. And that's an explanation. There's another method, it's layer-wise relevance propagation. It's an improvement upon guided backpropagation and it's based on a conservation principle. For those of you who know about conservation of mass, we know that a mass or mass is not going to appear or disappear out of nowhere. It's just going to get translated from one location to the other location. Similarly for energy, energy is not going to appear or disappear out of nowhere. It's just going to change from one form to another form, maybe from potential to kin kinetic energy. We are going to have a similar conservation principle for backpropagating. And what is the idea? Each neuron is going to receive a share of the network output. So your network is outputting a prediction. Each neuron is going to receive a share. And then it's going to redistribute it equally. And what we mean by equally, it's going to become clear to the previous layer. Remember, now you're going from your output layer to your input layer because your input layer is the one that is interpretable. It's an image, it's a text. And you do this process from one layer to the one before until you reach your input. Let's take a look at some of the visualizations that are gonna come out of uh, LRP. 
you have a bunch of images, and these are the explanations that are coming out of NRP. You can compare them to guided backpropagation, which is not conserving. It doesn't satisfy this conservation principle. It looks a little bit nicer, especially when, when you have this number three. It's focusing more on the number three itself and some on the boundaries. Not only that, there is a discontinuity here in the written number eight. Where you have a discontinuity should, in principle, be counted as negative points for the prediction being a number eight. It's going to make it less likely for it to be a number eight because this is a poorly written eight with some discontinuity. And your LRP is giving you some negative influence here. It's telling us that this part of the image is having a negative influence by me predicting the number as an eight, but I'm still going to predict it as an eight. Okay, something is wrong with this data. So it's going to have more information in it. How the process works is you're going to start from your output, and then you're going to assign relevance to each particular neuron in your graph from the output up until the input, the input. And then these RIs are going to give you the importance of every single pixel or the relevance of every single pixel for that particular prediction. So let's go through the math. How do you actually conserve these quantities? How do you actually make sure that this conservation principle holds? How do you real realize it? Let's say you're looking at your output neuron. So you pick one of your neurons and that, that is going to depend on the concept that you choose because your neural network might have 10 outputs from zero up until number nine. You're picking one of them. So you're picking, for instance, number three. That's the output. And that's your output neuron. It's going to depend on your input and it's going to depend on the output. So we're going to remove the output from this point on and re represent everything with f of x. So you can think of this as your score. The score of this particular image being classified as a number three. Then you're going to have a collection of features, your input, which is a collection of pixels, and you have D of them. What you want to do is you want to associate a score to every single pixel, and the score is going to tell you how relevant that particular pixel is for explaining the prediction. Now, let's say J and K are two consecutive are two neurons from two consecutive layers. Maybe this neuron and this other neuron from two consecutive layers. That's J, K, so J is the layer from before. And let's say you somehow found RK, which is the relevance of the neuron in the above layer. And the way that you're gonna find it is, for instance, the last guy, you know what that is. What is the relevance of the last neuron for prediction of the last neuron? It's gonna be f of x. So you know, from above, you're going uh, inside your neural network. So you're going backward. Now you want to divide this. You want to divide RK among uh, all of these uh, previous Js. The question is what share of RK should you distribute to neuron J? What portion of RK do you want to put here? And that's gonna be RJK in terms of notation. And that's exactly what you have here. What share of? RK, are you going to copy and paste down? Now, what is our conservation property? If you do a summation over all of these Js, it should give you back your RK. Some share of RK you associate it to J or the first neuron, the second neuron from the previous layer, etc. And they need to add up to the share that you had, to the relevance that you had. And that's your conservation principle. That's your conservation property. Something nice is going to happen. These RJs, by definition, are going to be the summation over Ks, whatever that's going inside RJ, of uh, the share of K that went to J. So it's going to be a summation over K. And now let's do this summation. You're going to have a summation over J of RJs. So you are putting a summation over RJs here with respect to J. We can take that summation, put it here. It's going to be a sum of J, K, all of these portions. You can reorder. You can first do the summation over K, then over J. And if you do the summation over J of these quantities, that's going to give you our case. And that's how you're going to prove that this identity holds. And then you can keep doing that. Go from one layer above to the layer below and keep continuing. And it's nice. Now you're explaining your F in terms of the importance 
or the relevance of every single pixel in your image. Now you are relating the prediction to the input. Now this is just a linear function. You know how important your first pixel is. You can just read it off. So that is all theory. How do you actually do this in practice? And that's, there's gonna be a bunch of rules that depends on the type of layer that you have. For instance, if your layer is the type of fully connected or convolution, which is gonna give you a neuron as a linear combination of the previous activities of previous neurons, plus some biases pushed through a nonlinearity, then the activity of neuron K is just a nonlinearity applied on a linear combination of the activities of the previous layer. So now you're going forward. Now let's try to go backward. There is this alpha beta rule. It looks a little bit complex, but don't worry about it. How you're gonna do it is you are gonna have some alpha and some beta. These are some hyperparameters for this propagation rule, which they have to add up to one or alpha minus beta should be equal to one and beta should be positive. If beta is zero, you can just get rid of this term. What do we have? Alpha RK is about being relevant, is about the positive influence of one pixel on the prediction. Beta RK is the counter relevance. So one of them is about this red color. The other one is about the blue color. This pixel is negatively impacting the prediction of the model. So that's where alpha and beta are gonna help us. You're gonna take some portion of alpha RK, which is gonna be alpha RK. You're gonna take some portion of it to give you R from K to J. How do you take that portion? First of all, these numbers, they have to add up to one. And it is very similar to the softmax notation that you had from before. You look at the activity of this particular neuron, you make your weights positive. Whenever they are negative, you set them to be zero. And whenever you're positive, you're fine. The numerator is gonna be a positive number. The denominator is a summation of a bunch of positive numbers over all of the Js from the previous layer. So this is gonna give you a proportion from zero to one. So what proportion of alpha RK are you gonna propagate backward? You do the same thing here for the counter relevance. What proportion of beta RK are you gonna push backward in your neural network? And that has to do with the negative part of your weights. So whatever in your weights that is negative, you are gonna keep the absolute value of that. Otherwise you're gonna set it to be zero. So these are all positive numbers. And then that's gonna give you what proportion of beta RK are you gonna push backward? through your neural network. And then you keep doing that over and over again. This is for a fully connected layer or a convolutional layer. You're gonna have similar rules for uh, max pooling type of layers, and then you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be able to back propagate your output to the input and know the importance of every single pixel and be able to do visualizations like this. And here, what you're actually plotting is your R eyes. So you're plotting all of these are eyes. And you have D of them, as many of them as you have pixels. So you can just plot them. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative, some of them are more positive, some of them are more negative. And these are the type of visualizations that you're gonna get. So what's everything clear? Are there any questions? Okay, perfect. So this is an improvement over guided backpropagation. And it's based on the conservation principle. And the conservation principle is here. You want to be fair going from one layer above to the layer below. And how are, you, how are you fair? That depends on the activities of your neural networks and their corresponding weights. Okay, if everything is clear, we can move on. But the cool thing about this paper was the definition of understanding, what we mean by understanding, the definition of interpretability, and the definition of being explainable and explainable AI. This is useful. Because deep learning is not only applied to images, it's not only applied to text, it's not only applied to speech, it is being applied to scientific domains, like quantum mechanics, like molecular dynamics, like medical imaging, like brain activity, those sorts of images coming from visualizing brain activity. Now that you have a model that is explainable, for instance, in the brain activity case, you can, uh, look at the visualization of the people who are right-handed 
and the people who are left-handed, fit a neural network to the type of data that you have, and then ask these sorts of questions. What type or what part of the brain of that person is being activated more when they are right-handed or where they are writing something with their right hand versus writing something with their left hand? And now you're discovering knowledge out of a black box, okay?